Well, hi there, uh, history uh, class. Uh, this is Joe Crowder, your instructor, and uh, today we're going to be talking about the leading up to the American Revolution. You know, the one that started in 1776. It's been ingrained in your brain since you were in elementary school. But I want to talk about St. George's Field Massacre. I take a look at the uh, depiction here, and we see what appears to be, it's black and white, but red coats uh, firing upon a crowd very reminiscent of what happened in Boston, in the Boston Massacre. But where the heck is St. George's Field? And why are these troops firing uh, into this crowd? Can you guess the city? Because if you said this one, you would be correct. How many of you have heard of St. George's Field Massacre? Probably not very many. Uh, it took place on May 10th, uh, 1768, and it had a lot to do with representation in Parliament. The very same reason, uh, allegedly, that we had gone to war with Great Britain in 1776, espousing our independence, is because Britain refused to allow us representation in Parliament. The famous saying, no representation without taxation, follows here. The thing is about this particular St. George's Field Massacre is going to come up again and again in this particular uh, slideshow. So, But I want to back up a couple years before uh, 1768 and actually go to 1765 for a governor of Massachusetts was in a panic. And this is a small portrait I found of the governor, Francis Bernard, Sir Francis Bernard, again, one of those uh, progenitor type class people. Sir Francis uh, Bernard, one of those progenitor type classes of people uh, who um, are of the aristocracy or the nobility that's appointed by the king to come over to the colonies and attempt to restore some sort of order. He's in a panic. He sends this particular uh, document to London to the way at the bottom there, the very, very bottom, Lords Commissioners for Trade and Plantations. And we're going to talk about them in a little bit. Uh, Francis Bernard Esquire, again, he is the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, he's Notice the date, September, October, and November 1765. What he has done is he had collected three months worth of newspapers from throughout Boston and surrounding areas in Massachusetts and put them together and sent them to London, sent them to the Lord Commissioner, sent them to the Trade and Board of Trade and Plantations. Describing the mobs, in 1765. The newspaper descriptions of the mobs in 1765. The amount of sedition that was written into the newspapers against Parliament, against the King, against Great Britain. He also put in these papers many, many descriptions of a guy by the name of John Wilkes. Who's John Wilkes? John Wilkes is the very person that in the previous slide we saw the St. George's Field Massacre had to do with John Wilkes back in London. Colonial newspapers followed the exploits of John Wilkes back in London because John Wilkes represented something that American colonialists wanted, and that was representation in Parliament. John Wilkes, let's talk about who he is. First of all, let us know that he had been voted the ugliest man in all of England. There he is, seated by uh, a bunch of newspapers that he wrote, and he is carrying the Staff of Liberty. John Wilkes is a journalist, hero, radical. He, he was voted to be a member of parliament 
for a working class neighborhood uh, south of London called Aylesbury, 1757 and 1761. Uh, in 1757, when he was elected, he sat in Parliament for those, and he was once again elected in 1761. He is what we call an avid Patriot Whig, and not to get too in-depth, Patriot Whigs were a small group of parliamentarians, um, a small faction that came from the larger Whig party, but the Patriots were more radicalized. And one of the Patriot Whigs had come to power at the beginning of the Seven Years' War, and his name was William Pitt. Well, when the new king, George III, comes to power in 1760, uh, he dismisses William Pitt, who had been doing a marvelous job, and brings in uh, Lord North, otherwise known as the Earl of Butte, uh, from Scotland to take kind of control. Wilkes did not like this, and in the Northern Britain, uh, Northern Britain uh, play on the Scotland, this, the, the realm known as Scotland, Issue number 45, another politically charged term, because in 1745 there was a Jacobite uprising against the king. It started where? Scotland. So it's a particularly uh, damaging account of George III, of uh, Lord Butte, and um, on and on. Uh, not very kind to the particular government at the time. In 1763, the Treaty of Paris is going to end the war. John Wilkes is going to be witty with his pen again and uh, condemn the British government for ending this particular war the way it did, um, according to John Wilkes and many others, by the way. They felt that the victory over the French had been much more conclusive than the treaty demonstrated. In other words, Britain could have gotten much more from the French in concessions than they did. So he uh, lamb blasts the government at that particular time. He's challenged to a duel. Uh, he takes upon himself to be in that duel. He is shot in the stomach. And uh, he also witnesses a change in the law. The law used to be that if you were a member of parliament, you did not you could not be charged with sedition and libel for things that you print or say. That you should have the freedom to say what's on your mind if you are a member of parliament. Uh, that rule has changed and now you can be held for libel. And uh, so John Wilkes decided, I've been shot, the law has been changed. Bonjour Paris, hello. Uh, he vamoosed, he left um, Britain. And this is particularly important because in that leaving, he was told that he could not represent Aylesbury. Uh, not that he couldn't represent Aylesbury, but he could not represent England. Now, I'm going to make a, a distinction here. He could not represent Aylesbury because even though he was elected in that region, a member of parliament from Aylesbury, a parliamentarian's job is not to represent his district, but to represent the empire. There's a huge difference. If you're representing just a few people, or a small region, whereas you're representing a larger, huge, humongous, not only country, but empire, uh, you're going to vote differently. Your constituents are no longer a small group of working class people in a suburban neighborhood. Your constituents are now a, an empire. But who's running the empire? And again, we go back to the progenitor class, um, who you should be representing. And this is something that American newspapers pick up. It's something that George Bernard is reading. It's what George Bernard sends to England. When in 1768, there is another election. John Wilkes decides to return, to participate in that election. Once again, John Wilkes is elected. However, this time, Parliament will not allow him to take his seat, 
not only that, but he is promptly arrested and thrown in jail, which is why there was the St. George's Field Massacre. And in that massacre, a small boy, I think he was aged 11, uh, ran for his very life, was cornered at some high walls as he was trying to climb over a particular wall to get away from British troops. They fired upon him, shooting him in the back. This is part of the massacre that occurred on that particular May Day. And again, it goes back to this idea of who are we representing or who will Parliament allow to sit within their chambers, but also who will Parliament allow for the people of its empire to be represented in Parliament. I bring up John Wilkes because his name comes up through American history, and it certainly came up here in colonial America in 1765. I want to talk about some schools of history for a moment, because it's how we remember the American Revolution. And I want you to think back how you were taught in elementary school, in middle school, in senior school, how were you taught the American Revolution? Reflect upon that for a second. Now I want you to follow me through here because when I talk about schools of history, I'm talking about schools of thought and how it's changed over time, how the memory of the American Revolution has been altered and changed through time. And we're going to go walking through that right now. I think for most of you, you are going to be taught the type of history I'm going to describe here, the history of the American Revolution according to the Whig School of History. Now, the Whig School of History said that uh, the American Revolution was a moment for liberty in opposition to British tyranny. A moment for liberty in opposition to British tyranny. The first book uh, that comes out like that is when the revolution is still rather fresh in people's minds. 1793, the Washington administration, the very first administration of this country. David Ramsey, History of the American Revolution, in two volumes. He argues that the British were tyrannical, that the king was tyrannical, that we had no choice but as liberty-loving Americans to overthrow that throne. Uh, excuse me. Eject the throne from the continent of North America to make liberty safe for all the colonialists. That's probably what you remember, but you, you also... Uh, David Ramsey had David Ramsey had others that joined him in this particular chorus. Uh, Mercy Otis Warren wrote a book, History of the Rise, the Progress, and Termination of the Revolution. That came out in 1803. And George Bancroft, History of the United States, in 10 volumes. It took him uh, 40 years to write those 10 volumes. All of it reinforcing the idea that liberty's moment came and Americans took it by the horn and we ejected British tyranny. But I just showed you St. George's Massacre where there were British subjects arguing for the same rights that colonialists were. So how can British be tyrannical if people in Britain also felt in some sort of kinship with their Americans, cousins across the pond. See what I'm saying? Another uh, school of history comes from Herbert Levi Osgood, American Colonies in the 17th Century. It came out in 1904. This is considered the imperialist school of history. Osgood will argue that no, it wasn't Americans grabbing uh, liberty by the horns and ejecting the British. No, really what it was was just a function of transatlantic misunderstandings and bureaucratic bunglings. 
that they didn't understand us and we didn't understand them. What Osgood did was interesting. He went to England uh, and spent a good amount of time, a couple of years in the archives, reading some of the primary documents from that period of time, uh, looking at how the elite of parliament was looking at the colonists, and that he actually did us a service, Lee, uh, Herbert Levi Osgood, in that he correctly identified a number of British elites, members of parliament, who argued in that the colonies were right. The colonialists are correct in their assertion. They should have a parliament of their own, at least, in, in the colonies, and then they should send representatives over here to tell us how they feel. That's all they really want. But there is a flaw in this particular type of reporting because what Osgood misses is that it, there was no transatlantic misunderstandings. You see, the British knew precisely how Americans felt. They could not help otherwise. And in fact, there were newspapers in England, like the North Northern Britain, like a, a newspaper called The Crisis, there were other newspapers that took up the American cause in London itself with the title London in it. The London Price Advertiser, I think, was one of those newspapers that argued that the Americans have a point. So there was no transatlantic misunderstanding. They very well knew, and the crowds that we saw at St. George's Field Massacre were also of one mind, similar to the mind of of American colonialists in Boston and New York and Charleston, South Carolina, throughout the eastern seaboard. And the problem, if we go back to the Whig historians, is that it leaves a lot out. If you can say it was the moment for liberty for Americans to shrug off uh, the tyranny of Britain, well, where does that leave women and slaves and people who do not own property where does it leave the working poor? Is not American colonies being tyrannical towards its own people? You see, the different schools of history have different problems, and that's why we come up with new schools such as this one. And what's interesting about this particular book by Charles Beard is the, <laughs> the name of the school of history that it comes under, the progressive school. That it explored the economic motivations of the United States Constitution. <clears throat> the people who wrote it felt uh, as if they had economic reasons to write the Constitution that they did. But notice the time stamp of this particular book, 1913, right in the middle of America's progressive movement. And if we haven't learned, if you, if you don't know much about the, prog the progressives, of the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, they were fighting against political corruption, particularly the corruption where corporations were buying politicians and creating laws not of the people, for the people, by the people, but of corporations, by the corporations, for the corporations. And you had this huge progressive movement passing all sorts of regulation to curtail the power of corporate America. And here we have, right in the middle of that, a historian by the name of Charles Beard, who's going to come out with a book that says, yes, this has been going on in history. He's a, he's a, he is a man of his particular time. And so if we go back to the Whigs, they're trying to build a nation, right? That's their job. 1793, we got a new nation. 1803, when that book comes out, we got a new nation. 1834 to uh, 1874, we're trying to build this new nation. We better come up with a story that outlines what we're all about. Liberties, freedoms. So you can't have a history that shows any uh, how we're anti-liberty or anti-freedoms. When we go to the imperial school, uh, again, we're looking at a, a period of history which is trying to uh, come to some sort of settlement with uh, Britain. So when we go back to 1904, we're coming into an alliance 
with Britain as we're moving towards the First World War. So we have to come to a better understanding of how we grew apart in the first place. And this kind of Herbert Levi Osgood good feeling, you know, is just misunderstandings. Really is that sort of thing at that time. And so we have these great books, these great scholarly books that have a lot of great history in it. But they're creatures of their time. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So as we move forward in time, every generation is going to look at history a little bit differently because we are creatures of our culture. Another great book that came out around the time of Charles Beard is the one by Schlesinger, uh, The Colonial Merchants of the American Revolution in 1918. Um, another good book was Carl Becker's The Declaration of Independence. So successful was Beard's economic interpretation of the Constitution that Carl Becker came and took a look at the Declaration of Independence and tried to look at that particular document, document with uh, the rose-colored glasses and the rose color was all economics, right? You, you put on your economic glasses and you read it as if it was an economic document, you're going to draw different conclusions. It's not a political document, it's an economic document. The Declaration of Independence were declaring independence not for any political highfalutin reasons, not for philosophy, not for liberty, for money. To be able to carry on the tradition of great smuggling that the United States colonialists had performed prior to the British crackdowns. Sort of. We move on. The next school of history uh, comes after World War II. It's called the Consensus School. And they draw upon the ideas of Locke, Law, and Liberty. Uh, the most famous book is by uh, Lewis Hart's The Liberal Tradition in America in 1955, uh, but we also have uh, Richard Hofstadler's book, uh, The American uh, Political Tradition, which also came out in 1955. And what's interesting about this is this is right at that huge height of anti-communism, uh, Cold War hysteria. It's John Locke. It's the rule of law. It's the love of liberty. That is the liberal tradition. That is what is alive in America. That's what makes our country great and moves us forward. The next school of history. A great historian, Gordon S. Wood, uh, but he is uh, of the NIG. Revolution was neither unique nor was it radical. The creation of the American Republic followed a, a certain script, but look at the time stamp again. It's 1969. In 1968, we saw the murder of uh, Robert Fitzgerald Kennedy. We saw the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. We had huge protests in the streets against Vietnam. Uh, many of the Vietnamese uh, Vietnam protesters pointed to the U.S. Constitution uh, saying that it was a radical document, a radical idea, that we had a revolution throwing off the cloak of an, of an imperial power that was colonizing us. Is this not exactly what the Vietnamese people are fighting for? To throw off their colonial occupiers, which happened to be us at the time? So, coming out of this very... Uh, he's a conservative historian, Gordon S. Wood still teaches Harvard University and he writes this book the creation of the American Republic was neither unique there were other revolutions that followed such as the French Revolution there were other revolutions that came to come before and it wasn't radical in other words you protesters in the streets of the 1960s you're crazy you're nuts another school of history though coming out of the same time if you can guess it, uh, Staunton Lynn, Class, Conflict, Slavery, and the United States Constitution, again 1968. This is the neo-progressive school. That it was the struggles between social classes that drove the events forward in the American Revolution. Hugely important concept, which we're going to get into also in this lecture. I so wish I had more time, but we don't. 
a book that's pretty popular for me or from my perspective because again I'm a cultural historian I take a look at trends um, and this particular historian JGA Pocock is one who takes a look at continuity things that stay the same even though history changes and so he's a British historian number one so he's not an American historian he doesn't belong to any American school of history he's kind of his own thing although schools of history do tend to cross the pond as historians are scholarly sometimes they don't recognize borders and they talk to each other across the Atlantic or across the Pacific or globally and they come up and form their own schools that are global in nature well, Pocock points to continuity um, and I I buy this particular argument Pocock said let's take a look at three British revolutions in 1641 there was the English Civil War in 1688 the Glorious Revolution and in 1776 the American Revolution all three of these events have one thing in common and that is a represents a continuity towards cherished British liberties Englishmen love their liberties interesting in the book this shocked me but the more I thought about it the more I think he's correct in 1776 colonialists in America are more British than the British that's coming from a historian born and raised in jolly old England so I want to take a look at this a little bit first we have this idea no taxation without representation we have a depiction here in New York streets in 1765 lots of protests stamp riots are going on these people are rioting over the Stamp Act that was passed that year so let's take a look at the 1707 Act of Union this is what makes England Britain because England will now merge with a country known as Scotland Scotland and England become one the British flag prior to 1707 looks entirely different they merged the two flags of Scotland and England but not Ireland Ireland was England's first colony had to sail to get there a couple of things the thing that I Ireland did have over the Americans though is the Irish were allowed to have their own Parliament in Ireland and then whatever the Irish passed or said in, in their Parliament they would send it to London to go before the British Parliament and at least they had some sort of representation although the British Parliament could overrule just about anything and often did that the Irish Parliament brought before the British Parliament if that made sense colonial Americans argue for this system this is a system that colonial Americans want Ireland has its Parliament why can't colonial America have its own little Parliament maybe in Philadelphia maybe in New York where all the colonials can come together and create a body of laws and then we can send it to beautiful downtown London talk to Parliament there and see what happens but we the British Parliament doesn't even allow this to occur for colonial America and a lot of that has to do with British governance so let's talk about that for a second there it is there's Parliament okay all right one side is gonna be your House of Lords the other side is going to be uh, your House of Commons John Brewer wrote a while back in, the, in a book called the pleasures of the imagination English culture in the 18th century that there was a problem with British Parliament 
in a bit. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Of course, you know that there's a House of Lords and a House of Commons. The thing with the House of Lords is if you become a member of the House of Lords, you're not voted in. You're appointed. And then that seat that you hold in the House of Lords, you're not voted any time. You hold it for life. So if you're a young man, 25, and you become a lord, or the king likes you, or you support the king, and the king gives you that position, you will be there for the remainder of your life. It could be 50, 60, 70 years. Further, when you die, your son, your firstborn, ah, progenitor, becomes and gets and obtains an automatic seat in the House of Lords based on that heritage, that lineage. It's the House of Commons that is all important to, well, Englanders and most British people after 1707. But the House of Commons had come to represent the commons of England, not just the lords. That they represented the merchants, the bankers, the traders, the importers, the exporters, the dock workers, everybody, all of England not just the rich and privileged class. Parliament had a reputation because of its House of Commons of fighting tyranny, of fighting kings who had become too tyrannical or too possessive of their power. Between the years, and this is where John Brewer's book comes in, between the years 1714 uh, and 1763, the House of Commons with a perception that the House of Commons was becoming corrupted. So Brewer took a look at this and he, and he gave us some numbers. In 1714, on the floor of the House of Commons, and you started to count who the members of Parliament were and what their lineage was, only 12% of the House of Commons member parliamentarians were titled nobility. But by 1763, it was 42 percent. Nobility is increasingly taking over the House of Commons. Gary Nash would write about this. Gary Nash, in a book called The Unknown American Revolution, would say that generations of colonists had viewed Parliament as a bastion of freedom, the bulwark against despotic rule. But now, Parliament, too, began to seem like a violator of colonial rights. Parliament was also becoming, according to Gary Nash, despotic. A part of this may have to do with the empire-wide perception that liberties are being corrupted. But part of this might have to do with that Dutch king, William III, who married Mary to become king of England. In 1696, at the bequest of the king, Parliament created the Board of Trade and Plantations. This is the interior of the room of the Board of Trade of Plantations. So when we're looking at these gentlemen sitting here, these are people who are appointed different regions to look over trade with a different region in the empire, to look over different plantations within the empire. So one of these might be in charge of Barbados. One of these might be in charge of Jamaica. Another one might be in charge of the uh, growing influence over India. One of them might be in charge of the southern colonies, or maybe just one colony in the south. One might be looking at just Ireland. One might be looking in the Mediterranean. One might be looking, or a couple, at colonial America. The Board of Trade and Plantations. These, again, are particular seats that you obtain as someone who is of noble rank usually, that have contacts, that have been to school with most of the members of parliament and houses of lords, and they obtained what we call a great position in the Board of Trade of Plantations to rule or set rules over how trade is being conducted. When we take a look at who these people are and the power that they're derived from, most of it comes from that progenitor class. The, the, the interesting thing is about whoever is in charge, and there's several men here, but only one of them will have constant daily meetings with the king. Constant. Letting the king know how his empire is doing. He has the ear of the king. 
the Board of Trade and Plantations becomes highly influential throughout the 18th century. It is these people who are looking at the American colonies and coming to the conclusions that they are cheating, that they are smuggling, that they are running rum and sugar and tea and coffee and tobacco and slaves up and down the eastern seaboard without approval from the king. They are running around the mercantile system. There are many colonialists who get rather rich smuggling outside of British law. The creation of the Board of Trade of Plantations is there to enforce, to bring back control over a colonial region that for the longest time had been working outside of the purveyance of British approval or English approval if you go before 1707. So getting back to Pocock's thesis that there's this continuity in history that for as much as things change things stay the same. In the British Civil War this fight to overthrow the king Charles which occurred he was beheaded uh, took nine years of fighting it wasn't over in a day at any point in time the revolutionaries and these were mostly Puritans who overthrew the government uh, they could have lost but the fact of the matter is that they had convinced people of ordinary means to participate in the overthrowing of a despotic king. And the poor working class, lower ranks of British society did join the army, and at the end of the year, or at the end of the revolution, they asked to be compensated. And not in money, but in certain other things. Let's take a look at this. Levelers are from England. This is the English Civil War, the time frame, and what they wanted was a more just and equal society. They were almost didn't participate because of the entrenched hierarchy of the British system. It's almost a caste system, in a sense. So they wanted to end the corruption at the top. This is where they saw corruption. It wasn't the honest churchgoers of everyday British society. It was the men at the top of the pyramid, starting with the king and his courtiers and his advisors and the House of Lords. This is where corruption occurs, in places like that. They wanted to have the vote. They wanted, or at least to have the vote extended further down British society's ranks. The thing about voting for Parliament, and English considers itself a republic, it's hard for me to say that this is true when in 1650 less than 1% of the population actually had the right to vote. That means 99% of the population never could get to vote. Now they tried to influence the vote of the 1% that did but that's not direct democracy. It's certainly not a republic in my... So what levelers wanted was to extend the suffrage to at least those of middle ranks, if not all the way down to us, the levelers who had fought. At least give the people who fought the right to vote for the future of England. And then let our children inherit that and let it grow over time, was the leveler argument. Levelers also wanted access to land. If we could just have our own piece of property, we too could be better off. In all of this, the levelers were denied. Now if we fast forward in time, again looking at Pocock's thesis that there's continuity in history, in the hills of North Carolina, there were a group of men called the Regulators. Well, the Regulators are from colonial North Carolina, and this was their heyday, 1765 to 1771. 
They too wanted a more equal and just society. They were looking at the colony of North Carolina, they were looking at the governance of North Carolina, and they were seeing that the politics of North Carolina were stacked against them. That it was the rich plantation elite, those progenitor class type folks who owned the politics of the state, who appointed each other, who voted for each other, who would not extend the votes down past anybody. That when there were improvements requested, if we go back to Nathaniel Bacon, who was in Virginia, and he requested help on the frontier, the response from the Virginia colonial government was, no. Of course, we had Bacon's uprising after that. Again, we go back to North Carolina, the people in the hills, on the frontiers, they're the ones that are taking the brunt of Native American society attacking them, we're also on marginal land, so they're barely able to scrape an existence. And any extra they have, they can't get it to market because they're so far inland. And there's no roads, or very few, and those that do exist aren't very good. So they want a more just and equal society. Of course, the politics of North Carolina is not going to allow that to happen. To the regulators, the way they look at it is that the North Carolinians the elites of North Carolina are equally complicit in corruption just as they are in London. They also wanted a chance to have a vote. If they wanted to go to the North Carolina State House and be able to have a say in the way that the government is run. The political establishment in North Carolina, of course, is not interested in distributing more power than is absolutely necessary. The colonialist regulators want also better land than the lands that they were given, not so much the mountainous lands, but they also want some lands down in the valley, in the alluvial fans, um, where land is actually rich, not marginal. In all of this, they will be denied over a great period of time. And so when you read about the regulators in your books, um, when the Revolutionary War is coming closer and closer, you will see the regulators attack not just the British, but also the colonial elite themselves in North Carolina. Let's talk about this particular shoemaker going back to Boston, Ebenezer McIntosh. On August 14th, 1765. Ebenezer McIntosh will lead a crowd numbered anywhere between two to seven thousand. Nobody really knows. And what they do is they rescue an effigy of Andrew Oliver. Andrew Oliver was the person who was tapped by the colonial government, by the British uh, Massachusetts governor and lieutenant governor to collect the stamp tax. Andrew Oliver meant very well to carry out his duties and as he attempted to do so was faced with hostility to the point where people hung him in effigy and he was hung outside the state office one morning. Now, the sheriff is told to go take the effigy down but Ebenezer McIntosh is there. He guards the Andrew Oliver effigy and he takes control of it. At the end of the day, McIntosh will order the effigy to be removed. They put him in a coffin, the effigy, and they walk it to the south end where most of the followers from Ebenezer McIntosh come from. Boston's South End is a working class neighborhood. They head to the South End where Andrew Oliver had built a brick office to collect the taxes and store them. The brick office is demolished. A crowd of several thousand attack that particular brick office, brand spanking new, and to make matters worse, once they dismember the bricks by brick by brick, uh, they tear the timbers down and to 
kind of put a burn into Mr. Andrew Oliver. They tend to stamp all the bricks and all of the timber. This is the crowd in jest. Hello. Not satisfied, Ebenezer McIntosh then returns to the north of Boston with his crowd, anywhere again between two to 7,000, and they head to Oliver's home. Once there, they smash in his windows, they burn down his carriage house, they seize his carriage and his horses, they rush in, destroy all the furniture, steal all the paintings, the silverware, rush into the wine vault, break out the wine, and they start drinking for several hours, at the end of which they light the house up in fire. Oliver's home is destroyed. Andrew Oliver quits. Twelve days later, on August 26, 1765, Ebenezer McIntosh now heads to the home of Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson. Again, a repeat of what happened before. And it's estimated this time that the crowd is much larger, perhaps as much as half of Boston's male adult population. Attacking the home of Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson while they were eating dinner. The glass breaks, the brick starts to fly, axes at the door. They barely escape with their lives, and again, by the next morning, the house is reduced to rubble. Everything inside taken. Most of this has to do with... I shouldn't say most. Some of this has to do with what happened once the Seven Years' War was over. England decided to, or Parliament decided to, pass something called the Proclamation Act, which the King signed. In 1763, telling colonialists throughout the eastern seaboard that they cannot cross over the Appalachians and into the lands that they had just fought to liberate from the French. The British wanted to take control of the other side of the Appalachians for the reason of trading with the Indians, creating trade with the Indian nations. This had infuriated people who were veterans of the Seven Years' War, and even those who were not veterans were furious at this, because at the end of the war the spoils go to the victors. Two-thirds of the British army that fought in the Seven Years' War were colonialists. They supported Britain, they joined hand in hand, they marched together. This is part of the problem, though, because the members of the colonialists who gathered arms to fight with the British were militia. Militia is very different than regular troops. There's no training of militia. You train a militiaman? No, not really, sort of. There's no very much discipline. And as the two fought side by side over the next seven, eight years, they came to know each other. The colonials looking at British commanders is too haughty. The British commanders looking at the colonialist is nothing more than just a ragweed of people. And there's something to this, because a colonialist militiaman would often just leave. Oh, I can't fight today. I've got to go harvest. See? Oh, it's planting time. I've got to go. What? We, we're going into battle. Sorry. So, when these British commanders at the end of the war head back to England, oh, they have stories. They have stories about the colonialists and their will to fight. The last to arrive, the first to run away, is how George Washington described militiamen. So this angers people. The Sugar Act of April of 1764 causes a little bit of anger, even though the tax is dropped by half. Well, wait, why would the colonialist be angry then if the Sugar Act drops the tax on sugar. See, there was this Molasses Act in 1733 that had this huge high tax on it. But 
you can pass all the laws you want, but how are you going to enforce it? What the Sugar Act did is it dropped the tax in half and increased the enforcement mechanisms by more than double. Now, if you are a smuggler and you make many runs between your colony and the Caribbean, bringing back sugar, molasses, rum, other sugary products, uh, you're watching your livelihood become very difficult. The Currency Act of 1764 told the colonialists that your money is worthless in the eyes of the British Empire. Stop using it. We don't want to see any more paper money. It's no good. It's not backed by anything. We will only accept payment in British pounds, sterling or gold. Now this causes a bit of a problem in colonies like Massachusetts where there's already not a lot of gold to go around. Or silver. Which is why paper was very popular. So the paper money disappears and the people who have all the gold and silver are certainly not of the lower ranks of society. The middle ranks, eh, some. Yep, you guessed it. The upper echelons somehow always end up with the hard currency, the golds and the silvers, which was part of the problem in Boston in 1764. Then you threw the Stamp Act. This was in March of 1765, and it was the stamp that broke the camel's back. It was proof that Parliament had been corrupted. Because this was a direct tax in the colonies. It had never been done before. This is a colony that's been around since 1620. So how many years are we looking at? 140 plus years? We're we would tax ourselves. In addition to the Proclamation Act, the Sugar Act, the Currency Act, and the Stamp Act, the new governor that comes in, Francis Bernard, Sir Francis Bernard at that, progenitor, he starts to write legislation, he starts to um, appoint people to the uh, town hall meetings, he tries to do away with them. To get rid of any assemblies, to reestablish British control politically as well as economically over this particular colony. So when Francis Bernard, the new governor, brings in a lieutenant governor, Tom Hutchin, they will try to, again, double down and disband those town hall meetings. Now, if you go back all the way to that Machiavelli document that I gave in week one, how do you control people who have enjoyed liberty? Liberty here has been enjoyed for 140, 150 years. Okay, so that liberty included the right of smuggling, but that's beside the point. Here's the problem. Again, empire-wide, parliament is considered corrupt. It's becoming just as tyrannical as any particular king. People start to take to the streets that they do not have any representation. The Stamp Act is proof of that. The Stamp Act is from England direct, bypassing town halls altogether. When you bypass the town halls, that had been an institution that's been around for 145 years. This is what upsets the people in Boston in particular. Then you looked at who the new government was, Francis Bernard, the new governor, Tom Hitchinson, the new lieutenant governor, all of them have cronies. It's too much. Now the Boston aldermen, so here's just a couple of names among a, a huge group. Uh, these are your middle class guys. Samuel Adams, Benjamin Eads, John Avery, John Chase, uh, excuse me, Thomas Chase, John Smith, Stephen Cleverly, and Thomas Crafts. Here's some folks, and they're looking at this guy who had these huge mobs of several thousand attacking first Andrew Oliver's house and his office, then the house of Tom Hutchinson, and now what do you do? You're the middle ranks. The Boston aldermen were absolutely shocked. Although they did egg it on a little bit, 
it got out of control fast. And here it was, Macintosh, Ebenezer Macintosh, that seemed to be in charge. In the words of Gary Nash, historian, these aldermen knew that they did not have control of the streets. That control belonged to this gentleman, Ebenezer Macintosh. And in cahoots with Governor Bernard Francis, they told the governor, why don't you put a 300 pound reward on his head? That's like a five-year salary to one of the lower ranks. One of them will turn him in. We'll get him arrested. Well, the thing is, he did get arrested. But the lower ranks, the crowds assembled outside of the jailhouse and convinced the sheriff, whose last name was Greenleaf at the time, that it might be in your best interest to just let him go. And they let him go. <laughs> In fact, several others were arrested soon after the release of this shoemaker. And they too were released when crowds convinced the sheriff that it was in his best interest to let them go. So who controls Boston? In a very interesting account in November of 1765 according to Governor Bernard at the time General McIntosh Bernard calls him that um, in November uh, by the way this is the State House the old Massachusetts State House and if you look uh, here at the Boston uh, Massacre print that's the old State House this is the same State House see In the old state house in November of 1765, it's a typical month of protest for um, for people who are of English lineage. We have this scene where Macintosh is going to walk by the old state house with approximately half the population, male population of Boston behind him, most of the working class poor. And as they're walking past the State House, they're not just walking as a mob, they're marching like a military unit. Now imagine you're one of those middle class guys like Sam Adams. Imagine you're the Lieutenant Governor, or even the Governor, looking out these windows, and you're watching this. And you're watching uh, half of Boston's male population marching in step in a regiment up and down past your state house. And what's interesting is they're not saying a word. They're deathly quiet. According to one of the elite who was looking out the windows of the state house down to the scene where the the people were marching back and forth that the general Macintosh was just a shoemaker would use just mere fingers and the entire regiment would shift a mere finger signal and they would halt a mere finger, a finger signal and they would hurrah a mere fig, finger signal and they would stop deathly silent And then Macintosh marches them off and dismisses them, and they go home. And Macintosh turns towards the state house and bows. It was a demonstration of his power. Gary Nash has a thesis, he has a particular book out called The Unknown American Revolution. And in, his, in that particular book, Nash argues that the revolution is not a top-down revolution. George Washington, he is not in charge. Thomas Jefferson, no. John Quincy Adams, no. Or John Adams, no. None of them. None of the founding fathers, as we have been raised, are in charge of this revolution. It's a bottom-up 
revolution. It's guys like this shoemaker, Ebenezer McIntosh, who are in charge, who are running things. These colonial elites, no. All they did was hung on to try and stay out in front of this anger of people who are fighting not just for English liberties against England, but fighting for English liberties against the colonial governments that are there in charge of them. If you remember the Whig School of History, it's evidence, according to Gary Nash, says it's the opposite. The Whig School says that Americans seized liberty to throw off the tyranny of Britain. What it is, ladies and gentlemen, if we use the Gary Nash thesis, and I want you to consider it, that it's the lower ranks of society, the regulators in North Carolina, the Green Mountain Boys of Vermont, the General Ebenezer McIntoshes of Boston, the lower ranks of society that are taking the bull by the horns and they're defending English liberties against any and all tyranny. And if you're a member of the colonial elite, as George Washington was, as Thomas Jefferson was, you have to make a decision. And for guys like Washington and Jefferson, who had a tremendous amount of property invested in colonial America, you best get in front of this groundswell and hope it comes out your way. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you.